England wraps up an impressive uh, victory in the first test at Gaul this week. Uh, and we are thrilled to be able to say we are joined by someone who was actually there uh, and is currently there ahead of the second test, um, Simon Dool down in Sri Lanka. Um, welcome along to 98 Night Out. Cheers, Darren. Thanks very much. So um, just uh, you're one of the few media guys down there. You're working, I, I think, for local TV. Um, what's it like? Uh, what's it like there? And what are your thoughts on this game? Um, look, it's it's interesting. Obviously, with with what the world is going through, and and you guys more than probably most in in England, um, it's just different, you know. I mean, life as we know it, as a cricket commentator, as a player, as a fan, which um, I know there's plenty of um, in the UK and and around the world, it's just um, it's just different. We we're, we're traveling, we're uh, in bubbles, we're uh, tested on a regular basis. Um, you know, Gaul was, it, it, I, I find it very privileged, to be honest, to, to be able to still do what we're able to do. And I think talking to the players, you get that same feeling as well um, on the ground. I know I had a, a really nice chat to Johnny Besto post the game the other day. And, um, you know, he was just incredibly, um, said it was incredibly tough what the players are going through at the moment, but also very grateful for what everybody's sacrificing for them to be able to apply their trade. So for us to be able to work, for um, the cricketers to be able to play and for the folks at home to be able to see some cricket, uh, I think that's first and foremost a, a real positive. And hopefully as a, as a sort of a group, we can, um, we can get through what's going on around the world and maybe get crowds back to, to games as well, which um, you know is, is a bit of a shame of being in a beautiful place like Gaul and Sri Lanka and, and not having crowds watching the game. A one-man crowd, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, got, <laughs> he, he was a great for 10 months. We, we could hear him. We could hear him. He was, he'd been out here for a year, I think. He, so he came for the original tour, which was March last year, wasn't it? And decided to stay and not go back home. Uh, and, and has basically been here since just working and traveling. So um, it's some dedication for you, that is. The game itself turned out to be uh, a cracker in the end. And particularly because England didn't seem to have much preparation or a lot of the players hadn't played for a while coming into this. So, um, and I think on both sides there were moments where that rustiness sort of showed, but in the end, uh, a great test match. Yeah, it was. Uh, look, winning the toss and batting first and scoring 135 was never, ever going to be any good for, from a Sri Lankan point of view. And um, they, that, that's what lost them the game. Um, England's bowling performance I think if you talk to uh, the England camp, I thought Stuart Broad was very, very good with the new ball and, and Sam Curran did a great job. Uh, they didn't really use a huge amount of Mark Wood. Um, Dom Bess will bowl a lot better and, and get two or three wickets on certain days. Uh, it, he Look, he was the first to admit he didn't bowl overly well, but you just take those. And, and having been there, done it, you, you, you walk off the park some days when you think, you know, I bowled really well today and I walked off with one or two wickets and you come off other days where you think you've got away with a couple of half volleys that have been hit to cover or or a couple of wide ones that have been nicked behind and uh, and you walk off with four or five wickets. So he'll take it, but it was all down to that first innings performance. And, you know, that, that 135 was always going to be paltry. It was never going to be enough. And then you backed it up with a magnificent double from, uh, from Joe Root, who, again, has just changed a couple of things around. And I think he's been... Um, uh, he, he said to me that lockdown was good for him. He just sort of worked out a couple of things that maybe he was doing wrong and, and um, you know, figured it out himself while he was just sitting in his lounge or, or working on his, on his shadow batting, perhaps. So uh, it was magnificent to see him back in amongst the, uh, the runs and sort of having to work his way back into that, that most talked about four or three that we, uh, that we always mention. It came Williamson, Virat Kohli, Steve Smith, and, um, you know, Joe sort of, dropped away a little bit of that and um, and it'd be nice to see him back in that same conversation. And he mentioned on interview as well, didn't he, that he, you know, he'd done a lot of talking before the test match and it was it was obviously nice to then back that up. Yeah, it was. And I think um, you know, by his own standards, he'd had a pretty lean time of it in the last 18 months. Uh, he'd seen that average go from in the early to mid fifties down to below 47, I think it was, or 48. And um, you know, just hadn't piled the runs on that he felt he should. Uh, as the captain and as as one of their best players, so um, you know, what better way could you ask to start twenty twenty one than um, you know than a big double hundred? Dan Lawrence looked pretty comfortable uh, on his uh, his debut. I know he's been around the squad for a long time with the the A's and the Lions and whatever else, but um, fifty on debut and uh, seeing us through at the end, that was uh, he looked he looked okay. 
I was really impressed, actually, with Dan Lawrence. Um, you know, I said to Owe Shah at one of the mornings before the game, uh, 15, 20 years ago, Dan Lawrence would have never made it through the English system. All that quirkiness would have been coaxed out of him. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a real, it's a, probably a positive sign of what England have, have done more so in the last eight to 10 years. It's just allowed players to, to be players at that age group level and, and runs is, is the currency. You know, it's not about how stylish you look. Whereas uh, so many years ago, and, and a lot of the England teams I played against, and, you know, without naming names, there was just so many correct technical players that when it got hard or when it was different, they, they found it really hard to play and, and they struggled with it. Whereas Dan Lawrence looks to me like a guy who's just done it his way. He's churned out the runs and it's hit currency as a batsman. So to me, I, I really like the look of him. The way he strode out there when England were, what, three for, was it 15 or three for 16? Yeah. On that um, fourth night, uh, he, he came out with some purpose. And then the following morning, just to finish the job off, um, really impressed. I, I, what, what it does do, I guess now, is that, not so much for the second test match in Gore, but moving forward and, and sort of throwing the crystal ball out there for the India series, what do they do? Uh, and that's going to be the little conundrum because if you imagine that, that John, uh, Joe Root bats four no matter what, Ben Stokes bat, bats five, Ollie Pope comes back in and bats six, uh, what do England do with that, that Dan Lawrence, Johnny Besto, Zach Crawley, Dom Sibley situation at the top? And, and that's going to be a, a talking point, I'm sure, after this test match and moving forward to England. Uh, to India, sorry. Given the quite crowded calendar for, for everyone this year, uh, and given this whole thing about uh, the problems of being in bubbles, um, everyone is going to need uh, big squads to sort of rotate around. We're seeing with the West Indies, the side they're sending out to Bangladesh is a, is a fairly new looking side. England seem to be in a really nice position because in a lot of positions, they have a lot of options. For example, the, wicket, the batting wicketkeeper um, obviously, Josh Butler, David Bairstow, uh, Johnny Bairstow, if required. And, and Ben Folkes is, is hovering there in the wings. Uh, and as he proved in Sri Lanka last year, he, he can bat. He got a ton there last year. Um, I think it's good and it's going gonna, it's gonna to help in a very crowded year, I think. Yeah, it is. And um, I, I know I've heard uh, Stuart Broad mention that he doesn't think that he'll play more than two or three test matches of the six. Now, he's already played the first one. Does he play the second one or do England decide to just completely change? Now, it wouldn't surprise me if they completely changed the tact and maybe went with um, Wokes as their all-rounder with Jimmy Anderson and with Ollie Stone in the second test match and just completely change the whole three of them around. Um, Mo and Ali, I'm not sure whether he'll be back, but they've got great options. And I think that's, um, you know, it's a sign of where English cricket's at. And it's also a sign of, and, and something that we've seen from India as well, in the last two, three, four years is the A program really working. So guys that are coming through that A system are actually playing a lot more cricket. They're getting battle hardened and, and kind of ready to play test match cricket. So, you know, it's going to be a bit of a, a fight as I, as I sort of said, I think between folks and Besto, whether they look to bat Besto at seven and keep in India, or whether they maybe look to open with Besto and Zach Crawley, bat Lawrence at three, and have um, folks batting at seven as the keeper. That would be my preferred option. If I'm, you know, if I was in Ed Smith's shoes, and I'm not, and I never will be, but <laughs> I'd actually, I'd actually pump pump Johnny Bairstow up to open in India and open him with Zach Crawley um, instead of batting Crawley at three. I'd keep Dan Lawrence on the side, bat him at three, then have uh, Root at four. Um, I'd have Stokes at five, Ollie Pope at six, and Ben Folks at seven, Moe and Ali at eight, which gives you a really strong batting lineup. Then your two seamers and another spinner. And it's a quick turnaround to the second test. Um, starts on Friday, is it? Um, the next one. Um, how do you see that going? You got any uh, any thoughts or feelings from the camp by the camp? Well, yeah. Look, I think um, I think the pitch will turn even sooner. Um, I, I love I love these pitches at Gore because they, they just crumble. They crumble. They explode. Day three, uh, and and you know it becomes a, a real test on, on day even day, late day two day three but what we didn't have in the lead up to the first test match was good weather fine weather um it rained pretty much every day that we were in isolation at the hotel here uh so the ground stuff didn't have any sunshine on the surface or anything there to maybe dry that pitch out early on 
what we did have through the test match, although there was a little bit of rain here and there, we had some really sunny days. And yesterday afternoon and, and even today has been relatively sunny. So I think the, the pitch, the new pitch for the second test match will be drier. And to me, that's Sri Lanka's best opportunity to win. Without being too rude, I think their spinners are probably better. I think Embledenia bowled, um, you know, bowled a lot better. And, and uh, Dilran Pereira, I think, is, is a pretty good off spinner as well. So they'll make one change. I imagine they might leave Hasaringa, the leg spinner, out and bring another spinner in. And I just think that their spinners are probably slightly better. So they want a drier pitch that is even more difficult to bat on. So I imagine it might be turning at the end of day one um, for that second test match. So, you know, it might be a shorter test, but I still think it'll be pretty enthralling to watch. I think the gulf between the two sides, it would have been interesting if Sri Lanka had got maybe 75, 100 runs more in that first innings. It would have been uh, potentially a very different story. Um, and maybe they're going to be looking at that and think going into this game that, um, that's what they need to do, whatever, whether they bat first or in their first innings, get a score on the board. Yeah, and I think a score on the board is anything above 280, 280, 300 in the first innings that Gaul has proven to be a good enough score to keep you in the game. And, um, you know, one, 135, 150, 160 is never, ever going to be enough. So they'll be talking about that. They'll be ruining that. And I, I think they're, um, they're still without Karuna Ratna. He's um, been ruled out of the test match. So what they do at the, um, you know, with that batting, with the batting positions at the top of the order, Mendes has had a pretty tough run of it through South Africa. So, um, you know, whether they make a change at the top order, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I don't see that. But, um, you know, no matter who bats first, whether it be England or whether it be Sri Lanka, you've got to put that 280 to 300 on the board and, and at least then you are in the game. Is it weird being uh, in a stadium, particularly Gaul, which is famous for the presence of spectators uh, and that historic fort is usually taken over when England are there by the Barmy Army. Um, is, it, is it weird? Is it, is it lacking or uh, what's um, it like? I don't say it's lacking. I mean, the, the players probably miss it a little bit. Um, you know, I went through the IPL and, and we sort of pumped the, the crowd noise in during the IPL. I know other tournaments have, have tried to do that. Um, We've been very fortunate just sort of come off the back of a, a New Zealand summer where we've had crowds, you know, we've, we've sort of kicked COVID at the border and, and, and basically kept it there. And, and that's been a real bonus for us. But um, look, it's different. It, it's, it's weird. It, it, the atmosphere is not there um, that you would normally have for a, for a test match. But I, as I said earlier, I think the players just kind of get it and they understand that that's the, the modern times. It's the current environment that they have to perform in and, and play in. And um and they, they seem to be coping all right with it. It's just it's just different. It, it's not bad. It's not good. It's just different. So I guess we better talk about New Zealand. Uh, current, they're currently number one in the world test rankings after the after that last series win. Looking good for 2021. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, look, we've been dominant at home. And I think that's what, what you need to be, with, no matter what sport you're playing. If you're winning at home and you sneak the old one away, You'll, you'll always be okay. And that's kind of what New Zealand have done. And, the, you know, the, the first series of the Test Championship, I think, was New Zealand's away win in Dubai against Pakistan, which really sort of put them in good stead for that. Then they came here to Sri Lanka um, post the World Cup, won a Test match in, they lost in Gaul and then won at, um, in Colombo. So those two away wins have been probably what have helped New Zealand get to the top of that, um, not not only the test um, uh, rankings, but also the, the top two in that ICC test championship race, uh, which is going to be huge. So there's other little things that are going to take place. I think India, England series will determine who stays in that number one spot and, and number two spot and even the Aussie South African series. But it'd be so nice for New Zealand to be at Lords in, um, in June, July, when that uh, final is going to be on. And I think, uh, I don't know whether it's confirmed yet, uh, gents, but I'm pretty sure New Zealand will be playing two test matches against England just prior to that um, World Test Championship final. So, um, so that's something to look forward to for uh, for your summer as well. Yeah, New Zealand enjoy a final at Lords, don't they? <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not against England, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! No, that was uh, no, what a what a fantastic game that was, and uh, and, and you know what I was most impressed with was the conduct of the of the 
uh, of the New Zealand side, uh, you know, all the way through that tournament and at the end as well. You know, it, that, that that shows how the game should be played. There's a lot of a lot is said about the spirit of cricket in particular, um, but um, I thought the way they they conducted themselves uh, after an incredible game of cricket that could have easily mm. easily gone either way. Um, uh, yeah, them a lot uh, it'll go down as it'll go down as one of those the greatest games of all time. I think. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, nobody lost, um, <laughs> and nobody won. It kind of was just it was just one of those situations where one team had to grab the trophy at the back end of it. And um, you know, I was I was pleased as much as I was sad for New Zealand. I was pleased throwing Morgan in England as well because um, you know he, he's a terrific bloke and what he's done from that 2015 World Cup when England were were so poor um, to transform. That England side and and play the brand of cricket that um, you know probably the, the brand of cricket that Brendan McCullum, who is a very good mate of Owen Morgan's, what Brendan tried to do from a New Zealand point of view, um, it rubbed off a little bit on on Owen Morgan, I think. And um, you know if it wasn't going to be us, then then it couldn't have gone to a, a better team. Yeah, and it wasn't that long ago that uh, England were in the T Twenty World Cup final uh, and uh, that famous last over of Ben Stokes where. <laughs> Brathwaite, was it four sixes he hit and uh, totally, totally stole the... Uh, I mean, that, that was really brutal in, in, in sort of, uh, with the boot on the other foot, really. Um, yeah, and that was something that you, you, you thought Ben Stokes might never get over. But, I mean, look at what he's done post that and um, look at the cricketer he's become. I mean, you know, he's... Um, we, we still claim him. We still claim him as half Kiwi, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Which we kind of have to, we just kind of have to bite the bullet and you know just accept that he plays for England. <laughs> uh, many, many thanks, and uh, we hope to catch up with you sometime soon. Uh -huh.